so we should be live um so we have a the thematic tournament today starting an arena in uh, 22 minutes the link to the tournament is um, in the description feel free to um join the link there is also the link to the club this is the tournament open to all club players we're gonna practice nimzo tonight uh, but before we go there, uh, let's address the current topic, which is extremely interesting and related to a lot of things. All right, so let's go to the Twitter. Let's um, imagine my surprise when we see this on Twitter. All right. So apparently this guy played me on Title Tuesday and... Um, and he says, I reported him after accusing him of cheating during his live stream. In the video he shows, I actually do not accuse him of cheating. What I do is I click on the button, which is on chess.com for everybody. Anybody can click this button along with a lot of other options. Once you click on the report button, uh, there is uh, different options than you can put. So, basically, you know, I, I'm a pretty peaceful guy, you know, yeah, sometimes I get, you know, furious, sometimes I get disgusted, so I do a lot of things, I actually report a lot of people, for sure, um, and we'll get back to that later. However, this is the first time that somebody goes online to shame me for utilizing the option to... Um, report and this basically just put this person on notice and um, get the chess.com detection team to make a decision on my inquiry about my suspicion whether this guy was cheating okay so i'm shamed for utilizing a widely available option to ask the online professional team their opinion on whether my opponent cheated or not okay so all right so here he also says just a quick reminder to think before you move or speak it's a fair 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 statement but it goes let's see it goes both ways right this guy talks about respect before anything else all right so why don't we go to this video Okay, he put this video here. So I played Katakowski in yesterday's title two. And let's go to his channel. And one of the things that we want to pay attention to in this so channel. Here, uh, I don't know what took this. And one, as I came here, I see this video. It says, can I teach Karakamsky a lesson? All right. So this video is basically the same as that video, but he says, can I teach Karakamsky a lesson? It's from the same guy who says, respect before anything else. Okay, very interesting, right? So this guy who is national master, Speaking about the chess titles, let's go over what the national master is. In general, there are a lot of titles, but the basic feeder titles are grandmaster, which is the highest title. Then we have international master, and the condition is you have to be 2400 elo for the IM title. Uh, there is the feeder master, which is for the people who are rated 2300 or more. And then there is the candidate master, similar but at least requirements um, of 2200. So uh, this gentleman is at the level of the candidate master. He didn't even reach feeder master, international master level. I'm not even talking about the very coveted grandmaster title. And uh, he says here, can I teach Gera Kamsky a lesson? Okay, I think this statement pretty much speaks for itself. So, you know, and then you write something like respect before anything else, okay? After, after 
reading this and coming to see this, I basically just stop paying attention to whatever this guy says. All right. The second thing, because, you know, you take me to the social network to try me to shame me. All right. Why don't we go over to the chess.com? Uh, let's go to this game that we had. Okay. This game, um, I made a draw. And he is somewhere here. I know he's somewhere there. That was yesterday's tournament. Right there, the guy is. So that's the first time. That's a, a, a second time I looked at this guy. So what I see is that this guy has a website. Okay, he has a website. He is a top blogger. There's nothing in his blog. Okay. It says, with an outstanding background as a professional chess player and over 10 years of teaching experience, Robert Ramirez brings both his passion and his expertise to the board, helping you to believe and achieve. Well, there are two different things here which don't really mix. First is that it says you're a professional chess player and then it says you have over 10 years of teaching experience. In truth, in chess, you cannot do both. You are either a professional chess player who dedicates his life to playing professional chess and trying to follow the goal of becoming the world champion, or at least, at the very least, you want to be a grandmaster, or you, you teach. And uh, basically, a lot of players who cannot make it as a professional player, they have nothing else to do but, you know, to go into the teaching experience. So let's go to his websites. And let's look uh, what it says here, yeah? Um, where is this about Robert? Okay, again. So it says that he started to play chess at five years old. Okay, so like Capablanca has a potentially great future. And then he has participated in prestigious tournaments such as World Open Chess Tournaments and the Pan American Intercollegiate Team Championships. And thanks to his performance in these events, he has earned his national master title from the United States Chess Federation. All right. I don't know how prestigious World Open Chess Tournament is, but okay, fine. Pan American Intercollegiate Team Championships, great. But, you know, this tells me he doesn't have much playing experience. You know, if you consider yourself an expert uh, and very qualified professional chess player just by playing two events and reaching national master title, which is, by the way, from the United States Chess Federation. It's not even a FIDES title. It's a national title that is given by the local chess federation. Okay? So, um, I don't know. If we want to go into the FIDE, let's go into FIDE, right? Let's, his name is Robert Ramirez. All right, let's see what is his um, rating list. Okay, I just wanted to show you that even now I am really retired. Okay, I'm washed up, as people say. But do you see my world's position in the ranking? I'm ranked number 71 in the top 100 in the world. Okay? I am very close to Kazimchanov, Korobov, Bakro, you know, a lot of older guys, Ponomaryov, Ivanchuk. Yes. I'm washed up. I, I don't know how to play chess anymore. Yes. But for some reason, I'm still in the top 100 level players in the world. And let's see. This guy. Where is this guy? Okay. I just, I'm just very curious. Now, who is this guy that wants to teach me a lesson? Robert Ramirez. All right. Let's do the search. Who is this guy? There are a lot of Robert Ramirez's, but apparently he is from the USA, right? And there is only one Robert Ramirez that I can find here, which is 1982, who has no rating in ELO in FIDE. He has no rapid games, not rated games, and this is a rating progress chart for all years. And this professional chess player, you know, he has zero games. So, I don't know. I have nothing to commentate on his teaching based, you know, on a lot of pictures he had, you know, he and some defenders he has on the social networks, 
you know, apparently he is a great teacher. Okay, fine, that's fine. But when you decide to play chess and you want to say that you want to teach me chess as the chess player, not as a chess coach, you got to be very, very careful. And you have to really think, just as you said, you know, before you do something stupid, okay? So, you have no games, you call yourself professional chess player, okay? And then you wanted to teach me a lesson. I don't think there is anything else that needs to be said, okay? The other thing I just need to mention is um, my reply to this person was the following. Um, and the following reply was this. Uh, what did I say? I don't even actually. All right. So we are returning to this major problem. I, I will answer the questions later. Okay. Let me first just do this thing. This is very unpleasant part. I really don't like taking the dispute into the, you know, the, this is the chess thing, all right? He should have kept uh, this thing, you know, and wrote me a message or something or contacted me somehow. Instead, he decides to take it to the social network and shame me, okay? You know, there is a action and then there is a reaction, okay? All right, so, um, first of all, I use the button to report my suspicion of accusation, uh, of uh, impropriety taking place. They didn't ban him, I, t I took a look at the game. Okay, it's not likely. However, a lot of people, they are saying that streaming somehow automatically, you know, brings you above suspicion, right? It is not so. Um, there are a lot of online events which are very serious events like Global Chess Championship last year or the Rapid Chess Championship or now we have Everything Masters in progress. And they have very strict regulations in terms of the anti-cheating uh, rules. Every player must have two cameras. One is in front, it shows your face because you know there are a lot of programs out there that can use the eye tracking system to provide some data, right? But the very important is the second camera. And the second camera requirement states that you need to put your camera in such way that it has to be behind a player, it has to show the table where he is, it has to show the, his surroundings. And the players are also re asked before the, before the tournament starts, they ask to show the entire room, the setting, and sometimes they get messages, uh, you know, during the tournaments. That's how seriously, you know, um, the chess.com team, they actually view these events. There are multiple layers of uh, anti-cheating protection, okay? So I just wanted to, you guys to realize that there, there is a lot of things that are taken into account. So when you say a streamer, you know, like, okay, he is automatically protected because he's streaming, right? There is no such thing. Second of all, what I wanted to say is that I've been playing online chess uh, since 96, okay? When I retired after playing my match with Karpov, I started playing online chess. I played, throughout these years, I played on almost every freaking chess platform there is. There's Internet Chess Club, there's Play Chess, there is Yahoo! Yahoo chess and the etc 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 right and I played probably close to like 50,000 games throughout these years and every platform you know they they always were cheaters you know when, whenever there is a situation where a human can cheat for some reason you know people just you know very tempted they can not stop themselves and they go and cheat and um, it's always a fight, whether your cheat is going to get undetected or is detected, right? So imagine you playing online chess since 96. It's more than some people are born, you know, like more than kids, it, which, it, which is a completely different topic, you know, a subject. But what I'm saying, you know, you don't play so many games without building a system, you know, inside and my automatic system 
based on that experience in playing so many people of different levels, right? This guy is what, 2200? I played thousands of guys like him. In fact, if you look up the uh, FIDA rating list, uh, there are like 10,000 people basically rated at this guy, okay? 10,000 people. And throughout the 20, 30 years, you know, they've been rotating. There have been many people in and out. I have huge experience playing these guys, right? So, in my experience, by playing all these different levels of players, I build in the system. Sometimes, you know, this system is not perfect, okay? It happens, right? And uh, then there is another point which I wanted to make. A lot of people say, oh, God, I just is old man. He reports everybody, okay? I don't know where they get it from. I don't report everybody. Every tournament, maybe I report half. Sometimes I report half people of the tournament. Sometimes I report few people. Sometimes I report one people, okay? It doesn't matter how many I report, but I don't report everybody. It is possible that I report in every tournament, which is a different situation. It is possible. But again, playing over 50,000 games online, playing through the time span of like 20 years, you don't survive this and stay sane without using some system. And I have a built-in system which I use. The ratings are the, in major part, are correct uh, assumption of the player's strength. Okay, when I see a player, I see first of all a title and then I see the rating. Based on that, I have a certain assumption of how people play. Okay, so whenever I don't like something and accuracy is the most visible thing, uh, attribute obviously. And whenever I don't like something, I utilize my right as a player to report a potential uh, player, my opponent, for some impropriety. Okay. It's pretty bloody fucking normal. If you see something, say something, right? If you see something that's suspicious, say something. Otherwise, why? Would you just, you know, let go the crime go? Okay, so uh, what else did I want to talk about it? So I spoke about this, this, so pretty much that's it, all right? So I don't want to pay any more attention to this. And again, uh, if you're 2200, you're a teacher, you know, and then you go into this uh, game, okay, uh, and you talk about respect, all right. Why don't we see you play? Stop hiding behind online chess like a lot of uh, kids do. I you know, I even some uh, admitted cheats, like even grandmasters like Neiman, you know, he, d he gets my respect, you know why? Because he actually went and played for two years in Europe and he earned his grandmaster title, okay? He earned it. He, and with it, showing uh, his huge effort, he earned my respect. Okay? So, when I talk about respect, you know, why don't you go through this whole thing? Become international master. Become a grandmaster. You know, show your talent. Show your dedication. I want to see that blood and sweat and time spent, you know, to earn this uh, uh, title. Okay? And then, then I will listen to you. Okay? Because right now, what this guy says, you want to teach me a lesson? You know, this sounds like a high school. You know, I'm, I'm not in high school, all right? All right, um, that's pretty much it. So we have the tournament starting, which is this tournament. All right, so let's go. Uh, let's now see the... Um, Hey Texas Pete, what's up? Hey Falcon. Hey Tachiko, this guy cheat or something? No, uh, he is uh, not. He is not cheated, but he made a video of me clicking the report button, and then he posted this video saying that basically by clicking this report button, I accuse him of cheating. Okay, and he posted on the social network. And he tries to shame me, you know. You know, and this guy isn't even a, 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 an international master or something. Sure, my standard says whenever you have a player who is not even an international master and who plays at more than ninety percent accuracy, pretty much I don't look who it is. I just click the report button, 
just to make sure you know things are checked and verified you know uh, I don't have to make this judgment call what I do is I report my suspicions to the relevant authority and then they make the decisions they make the decisions whether this guy is gonna be closed or not you know uh, I'm gonna show you actually something um, let's see this there is this message here two days ago it says uh, I don't know if you guys can see it let me let me move this a little bit it says we have detected that one or more of your recent opponents has violated our fair play policy as a compensation for potential unfair rating losses we adjusted your following ratings okay so you know you don't get letters like that like this if you're if people think you're just paranoid okay I get this it's not very often but I do get it and I feel like you know I'm actually helping the community with my reports and the fact that this guy is actually writing this stuff what he's actually doing he's actually doing the opposite he is helping uh, he is shaming people into stopping to uh, do their chess citizen duty and actually you know uh, report people and um, verify who these people are um, I have a second account you know where anonymous account where I play a lot of guys and the number of these letters that I get you know these untitled players they play like every second every every second player I wouldn't even say even every third player they play 90% accuracy you know it doesn't matter if I'm a 2100, 2300, 2500, 2700 level. Every second person on, on that account, I, I kept getting like every day those messages. This guy is closed, this guy is closed, this guy is closed. You know? I don't know. It's, it's something about the human nature or something. Uh, it's pretty crazy. So, and imagine, you know, this is just on chess.com, but imagine meeting the stuff. Wait, did we start? Yeah, I think we started, yeah? Okay, let me make a move. All right, guys, so that was a small talk uh, I had to make to explain what is going on and to, you know, advise those same words to this guy that he wrote to me, advising to think before you say or do something. Dude, it goes both ways, man. And when you had when you write respect and then you pull this crap on me you know kinda any respect that I had for this guy is gone he just destroyed it completely good job alright this is pretty interesting line um, pretty interesting line so black gets the pawn but his king is a little bit open and um, what is this gift what is this gift he wants to play five take on d4 open my king okay makes sense can play h5 try to connect these guys but i want to do this i want to do this um link of arena isn't the in the in the description of the title um this is the link okay you need to get the clopped also all right, so what is this situation? Um, bishop b5 or bishop e2 or something. Um, maybe even h5. Not sure exactly. All right, so I think the situation is addressed. I don't think we have to escalate the situation. Um, hopefully people are smart. And they know when to stop because you know th this is kind of 
unpleasant because you know the, the idea is we all love chess right we want what's best for chess we all agree that cheating in chess is horrible right so we we all trying to to do things yes there's a big danger that you go overboard yes sometimes i report people not even sometimes it's actually majority that a lot of my reports you know they're being rejected it's it's true sure but um but sometimes reports come true okay and uh, as i mentioned before uh, the people that i reported if they're playing uh, fairly and they found to be playing uh, non 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 cheating then it means that you get a sort of a commendation from me okay that means you have either huge talents okay here here take 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 and there is some danger yeah hmm. all right so maybe it's time for e4 yeah and uh what that means is that you know i recognize your strength you recognize your talent and okay good luck okay that's all that it means hmm all right, good job by black in this game he managed to hold his pawn and deny me much of the counterplay mr tachiko just joined the event you can join the club for free joining the club is for free man and then just play, okay? There should be a seven with idea of c5. Okay, we get it. So we need to move the rook. And we need to move the king out of this diagonal. So the only question is, um, what are we going to do about this d4 idea? So if I... Okay, check first, yeah. Got to do the check first. Because then we're going to close off this bishop. Hmm. Right. You can join the club and then you can uh, click on that link, okay, and join the event. Uh, I also did a YouTube video recap of the yesterday's crazy game between uh, Ding and Nepo. So, f so feel free to take a look at it. Hello, Mr. Nor'easter. And C6, right? That's the move that you missed, probably. Yes, you have some checks you can take, but you know, after this king gets safe. I think why it's just completely fine. Hmm. All right, let's king g1. It's important to move the king away from all the checks here, there. And now black pieces are discoordinated. No coordination. Bishop c4, bishop d3 probably is better. We don't want to allow this bishop on this diagonal. So that's why the pawn is here. Uh, so probably now pretty much winning for whites. Rooks are playing. His rooks are disorganized. The bishop not playing. King is kind of open. So probably can just take, take, go for this. Go e6. Open the rest of his king. But still, not a bad game, man. Good try. Good try. All right, just check. The king is super unsafe. Let's push the spawn. There is no threat to the white king at all. There is check. 
Chuck. All right, good job. All right, uh, so we're playing Nimzo's thematic to tournament today because you know yesterday we had this absolutely amazing game um, between uh, Dink and Nepo, and it shows how this why this opening is considered to be a fighting opening and why white oftentimes they don't allow nimzo they go into the queen's indian knight of three and then they play g3 which is way less sharp okay nimzo is extremely sharp opening um because you allow your opponent to get a lot of counter chances all right next game thank you mr old samovar for subscribing for three months now wow thanks a lot man queen b3 id is interesting uh yeah the the, the whole nimzu is very very interesting very i really like it oh yeah there, there's this this plan so sometimes i play like this you know he plays a 3 4 i play like this we both protect our center and then we get the structure Um, all right, trade the bishop, then I can play, hmm, queen c8, I think it's fine, so I, I want, I really want to get my queen in there, but also there is the threat of taking queen c3 with the check, which is still a threat. Maybe it's not so, you know, dangerous, but it's still kind of a threat. Hmm. Yeah, there are a lot of lines in Nimzo. Pretty much every line is, is a, leads to a huge fight. Okay. French structure, yes. But French and Nimzo, you know, a lot of openings, they transpose into each other, right? Like London and Karakhan. And the, the, especially the Panov or the C3, they're very, very similar. So Queen A6, Kainer, if he moves his Queen, it stops the um, the castling. But if he trades the Queens, then his attacking potential is limited. And I would say Black is pretty much fine. Yes, the bishop is very, very powerful here. That is for sure. And the knight on a6 kind of sucks, so let's bring the knight back. Because this knight belongs in the traditional French square of c4. So that's what we're going to do. Um, thank you for the recaps. Rook a2, interesting. Yes, Mr. Logic. That was extremely interesting plan by uh, Ding. All right, so let's play f5. Let's stop the potential aggression here on the king side. You give the chance for white to recapture here, but uh, I think, but h4 is kind of weird. Um, on the other hand, he wants to play h5 and create some pressure. Well, I guess it's possible. All right, but if I play h5, if I don't allow this h5 binding thing, then how exactly Y is going to demonstrate his um, global threat level? Enjoying a nice cigar. Gone to French from Mora and French Benonim. Sure, a lot of times. Um, I mean, black doesn't have much plan, so obviously one of the plans has to be where you attack this pawn. And you have to utilize the squares, but you have to prepare for it. You can't just go swinging about it. Okay. Uh... Because if you play knight a4 immediately, it can run into bishop b4. So that's why you need the second knight to protect the first knight. 
And once these two knights protect each other, pretty much black is fine. Yeah, so play g6. Um, yeah, white is thinking on both sides of the board. This is a pretty good sign. It's, it, it shows that the guy, you know, that the player has the view, not just in a very limited part of the board, but he sees the game as a whole. That is actually a very, very good uh, thing. Okay, that's ideally what you what you want to do. You want to try to see and connect what happens on one part of the board with this part of the board. All right, so I, I'm just gonna play um, this, and I want to see what White wants to do here. Right now, Black is just defending. I'm just defending my weaknesses. Um, these are the only weaknesses that I have. And also look at how powerful wise bishop is. But okay, if you allow me to play like this, your knight is extremely important. This is your only knight, man. Um, why would you allow me to take this pawn? Dude, you, uh, you always play a5 in such position. You don't care whether this pawn is taken because if it is doubled, double pawns are meaningless. Then you get at least the file, okay? Because now you just lost the whole pawn. Black is super safe. The bishop is now not strong at all. You really needed to combine bishop with the knight. Okay, bishop takes some squares and knight uses that limitation to advantage. You also should have thought about knight g5, h7, f6 idea. You really need the knight, okay? Don't trade off the knight. Yeah. How to join thematic Nimzo tournaments? You go to, the, um, to this link. Hello, Mr. Chespon, how are you? All right. This is a very old system. I used to play the system with white, especially after Kar Karpov-Kasparov matches in the 80s. That was before the computers got strong. Yeah, that was a no, different era, man. Take first to ensure the uh, double pawn aspect of the structure. Usually white has a pair of bishops to suffer for this, but not in this game. Uh, so this is really not how you want to play with white, okay? Because you don't have compensation for the double pawns. And yes, black does not allow a5. The other question whether white is much worse or a little worse, that is a different question. Um, yes, there's, uh, he's not that much worse because um, the position is closed, uh, pawns are still in the center, and there is no clear way to get to this pawn. Okay? Traditionally, it's the knight on a5, c5, rook c8, bishop a6 doing damage, but not in this position. So. It is a little bit better for black, thanks to the pawn formations, like we always talk about how pawns should be on the color opposite of your bishop. Uh, but you don't really play d5, uh, because you just give me my knight a big square, and now the bishop gets the target. Yeah? And also, when you have double pawns, you play d5, your pawn structure becomes completely rigid without possibility of any breaks like c5. The c5 break sometimes what makes a big difference. All right, so bishop here. And knight can go actually to b7 or... Because this knight is not better than this knight. Okay. So the big question is... Um, actually, wait, I could have taken this pawn, yeah? I'm talking too much sometimes, yeah. <laughs> All right, definitely take and play g5. Another set of double pawns. I'm very happy. 
for black of course and then we have to think how to improve my knight's position yeah so f5 is very interesting i'm thinking knight d8 i'm thinking knight d8 um, knight c5 is also quite interesting i just want to play f6 here definitely take with this pawn F6. Because that rook has to stay defending on. I mean he he must probably put the knight somewhere here. Right, so knight has to go, knight goes here. Knight b7 was interesting to keep his knight on c5. But I'm trying to find this idea. If I can get my knight to g6 to f4, that will be a huge thing, I think, right? Because knight belongs in those squares. Yeah, uh, he should have moved the king, right? Because... Okay. Alright, so let's attack the pawn then. Grab, grab, check. And the easiest way to is just to take this pawn. You get extra pawn, you get to attack these guys by playing rook f4. And there is not much that white can do here. So now these pawns are extremely weak and you just hit them. Okay. Um, right. Yeah, knight a4 was possible. Knight a4 was possible, correct. But I, I'm taking, I'm looking at the big picture. I'm, I'm some, I often miss tactics because I'm looking at the big picture. Okay. So he attacks this pawn. Um, all right, king of six. I'm just curious about them, something. Um, Rook e4 does not seem right. Rook e can probably play it. h5, time to push the pawn. <laughs> yeah, my wife just arrived from exam week from university. God, it is very stressful. I forgot how stressful universities are. Exam weeks, my god, it's been such a long time in my life, but I'm so happy I don't have to do this anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah. You have dabbling with Benoni, great. You should actually Practice all sorts of structures. Make sure you don't stay behind. Yeah, even if you focus on one opening, and then I highly encourage you to still try and practice all other openings as well, because maybe you get inspiration from that opening. All right, a3 is very common. So again, then I play c6 and d5 in this case. Okay, b6. Getting this structure, very interesting. Uh, wait, what? I was just com I was com com uh, com commendating you for the c5 and then bishop f4, d6, idea f3, e4. You know, holding this pawn here and then you just take my pawn, man. Oh my god. Alright, d5. If I can get b5 in and we fix the spawn structure, black is pretty much better. 
All right, 97, stop 95. Next, what we want to do is our bishop is pretty bad. He is locked by his own pawns. So we really need to trade this bishop, okay? Or activate the bishop to a6. Great. Thank you so much for subscribing. Thank you, Swiss. Oh, donation. Oh, even better. Thank you so much. 25 bucks. That's a lot. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. So two ways to play this position. Um, try to go for e5, but then you can fall for bishop h3, cheapo. Or you can just go and try to focus on this weakness here. So I'll probably do that. And the only way to focus on this pawn is just go caveman style. And just bloody double your rooks, triple, maybe even then build Alhein gun. Force it to a4, hit it with everything you got, bishop, rooks, queen. It's, it'll, it'll be not easy to protect it against this combined force. So let's do that. Rook a8. Um, you played a few times with no theoretical knowledge with mixed results. Okay. Hello, Mr. Atomic Morphe. Um, you're correct. There will always be openings with which you will be uncomfortable. But it's important to bring yourself out of that comfort zone. So queen g6 or bishop b5. Bishop b5 looks very reasonable since he allows me to freeze this pawn actually in the a3 square, which is even more vulnerable than a4. Um, we are not here to rough people up. We're here to let people play different openings and practice and learn stuff. Chess, you know, there, for, for a lot of people, chess is about, you know, winning, right? Roughing up, showing your domination. And that's a pretty valid, uh, you know, pretty valid way of playing because some people are just super competitive. And then there are people who just want to learn and this is a very interesting move, but I guess I'll just have to take it. Take this pawn. If you can take a central pawn pretty much for free, you should do so. Hmm. Alright, so it's time just to grab. Yeah, you can probably play a five and but then if you play a five, then you really widen up the zone of conflict into a wider zone here in the center, allowing for some potential weakness weaknesses. So don't do that. And just focus on one thing at a time. Grab the pawn. The name of our club. Um, If a pawn is doomed, um, <laughs> that's a very good question. But is it really doomed? Okay. Is it really doomed? Because maybe it's not doomed. All right, bishop c4. The bishop needs to stand opposite the bishop on g2 and uh, say that I oppose you, sir. I oppose your pressure on the pawn c6. The first instinct reaction is just to trade everything when you have uh, extra material. But in this case, um, it's kind of a chicken way to play the position. What we can do, however, is we can probably force the queen trade here. That will be a good thing. 
I think that's actually not a bad thing. Plus, you force your opponent to give up the file. And the file is very, very important. All right, queen b4, trade, trades. And again, the big question, what are we going to do here? Because he is ready to play knight d6. I don't have much time. Hmm. Probably b6. Okay, white seems to survive this, yeah? Yeah, I think white completely survived this. Completely survived this. Um, yeah, I made some mistakes, I guess. Good defense. See, activity is important. Activity allows you to, to survive stuff that normally you cannot survive. Bring the kingo to the bingo. Okay. This rook is very, very nice. Keep pushing. Yeah, I just, you know, do this thing. Push the pawns. Because we have a majority of the pawns, so it makes sense to actually push them. E4 also, probably is okay. Now we have two pawns, two pass pawns, which is very, very nice. You know, you gotta do things slowly. All right, thank you for the game. It was, it was nice defense. Wait, how long was the arena? Oh, I forgot to put it, okay. All right, so anyway, um, let, let, let me do the, uh, we did the short names arena, right? Let, let's do the arena for the today's game, which was Spanish, all right? So let's do that one. I uh, forgot that it is, uh, I forgot to put the timer on two hours. <laughs> All right, let's do new tournaments. Um, wait, it's not arena, it's club event. Let's do a club events, new arena. All right, let's do the Spanish, right? And then you can uh, practice your Spanish. Make sure it's not rated. Time control, three plus two. Start date, we start in, um, let's say 10 minutes, okay. 46. fifty-six, And let's make it one hour at least, okay. Book opening. And let's make Spanish. Rayo Lopez. Wait. No. Why starts in one hour? No. Oh, what happened? Oh, I put it on 22. Okay. Sorry about that. Gotta redo it. Gotta redo it. Jeez. All right, let's do it again. At least I'm getting hang of it. You know, it used to take me a long time to set it up. Three, two, not five, three, two. Start dates. All right, let's start at 22, zero, zero. 13 minutes, okay. So we're just gonna chat for, no, let's do 90 minutes, okay. Set up book opening, Spanish, Rayo Lopez. So you can try different sorts of Spanish opening and create. 
Is this okay? Looks okay, yeah. All right, I need to remake the... Um, uh, Streamlabs. I need to remake the link to the tournaments. All right, the link to the tournament now is um, this. Confirm. Done. Okay. Yes. Um, you don't think you have one against Mercy all this year? Okay. Can you talk a bit about Mercy Bind? All right. Uh, Mercy Bind is um, it's kind of complicated. Um, it also have to do something uh, with the personal preference, right? Almost any openings can be played, but if you really don't like specific pawn structures, you shouldn't really play them in important games. You can practice them, but you shouldn't play them. Which is why when I when I I don't like playing on the black side of the Mercy pawn structure. Okay, uh, what we're talking here about is, um, for example, the very, f ah, okay, we need to do the analysis, yeah. All right. Uh, all right, whatever. So what we're talking about when we're talking about Maris the Bind, we're talking about this sort of specific pawn structure okay it mostly arises out of the accelerated dragon but it can arise out of a lot of other openings for example i play khan uh, with black my whole life and one of the really annoying lines is when people play the c4 line against me i always hated it um, the reason is because I'm forced into the hedgehog formation. Yes, there are theoretical lines with knight c3, bishop b4, but also because I don't really like French, so playing, for example, lines like this, where you have to give up the bishop, is not really something that uh, I like. So that's why I ruled out this line. And which is why I mostly play hedgehog with queen c7, sometimes d6. Okay, this is also Maris the Bind pawn structure. It is these pawns, okay, where you manage to control a lot of center. That's why it's called Maris. It's called the Bind because these pawns take a lot of central control. And Black is often limited in his uh, pawn breaks in the early game. However, Black's goal in the middle game is to actually complete and do these pawn breaks. And once he does that successfully, uh, black usually manages to equalize, okay? But they're markedly different plans. Like, for example, in this structure, black doesn't have that many plans. Because you have pawn structure like this, you have basically either hedgehog, or you go bishop b4, or you go knight c6. If you play Sicilian accelerated dragon, usually white stars c4, uh, with the pawn on e7 and the fianchetto bishop, you have a different um, middle game plan for black. And what this plan involves, usually, it is, it looks like to be um, black's most reasonable plan. There are theoretical ideas where black plays knight g4, and then goes into knight d4, and then again, there are many ways to play this. You can play e5. In the 80s, 96 was extremely popular. And the idea was that the white plays bishop d3, you play queen a5, b6, and then you sort of go into this g4, queen e5 sort of idea. Okay? And then you try to make use of this knight to control the squares, play bishop b7, and sort of go for this kamikaze attack on the king side. 
trying to keep the center closed. This was very, very old plan. Um, but in the modern days, the, there is another plan, uh, which seems to be giving black the best opportunities, and that's the standard d6. Castles, castles. Yeah, uh, I, I'm not talking about knight d4, queen d4, and then this whole thing, right? But okay, in general, I want to talk about this plan where white plays something like this. And black wants to take here and play knight d7. And the idea is you want to you want to sort of actually actively want to trade this bishop, your defender, which you keep in a normal dragon, you keep this bishop alive at all costs. But in this particular situation, you actually want to trade this bishop because then you get this knight on c5, which is really untouchable, which creates pressure on the central pawn. It helps you to create pressure on this pawn chain of white plays b3, c4. And if white ever plays knight d5, you can just basically take this guy. And thanks to this unstoppable knight, you have knight and queen versus bishop and queen. And then you can basically play something like this. And again, thanks to this knight, black is pretty much okay. But you also don't have to play e6. You can play f5 here in this structure and sometimes get away with it um, because knight can go to f6, rook f7. And this only weakness is sort of easily protectable because white has no knight, no possibility to use this weak square. And the only chance to do this is by playing stuff like g4, which is extremely double-edged. Okay, so the idea is uh, the modern idea is to play bishop c6, a5, knight c5, and if white is willing to trade the queens at some point, for example, like this, and then theoretically black really wants to play e5. Okay, and as you can see already, the computer says black is a little bit better. So this is a strategic way of playing this position for black. Um. So that's pretty much brief overview of the Marissa Bind the pawn structure. Okay. Um, no, I don't have resource. The only resource I have is, uh, you know, a lot of openings like I play in Blitz game because, oh yeah, thank you for reminding me. I, I want to talk about this. Um, you know, this, this whole online chess thing, right, uh, is completely different from the classical board games. And uh, because of the way chess.com structures its uh, platform, it utilizes a lot of... Um, aspects which are illegal in the classical board chess. Like for example, pre-move. I think we spoke about it many times. Pre-move is highly illegal in chess. The whole concept of touch move and wait for your opponent's move first, or even hit the clock before making your own move, is being thrown out of the window. Also, blitz is uh, terrible because um, it encourages all the aspects of chess which are very detrimental to your classical chess. It develops thinking which goes only for the two, th three move combo depth vision, okay? So for, 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 for these reasons, I don't regard Blitz as, you know, very useful. In fact, I think it's very detrimental. And um, because of online aspect of the nature of the game, because of the limited time you have. You cannot think deeply, you cannot create something nice, pretty much. Yes, you can create something, but you know, it is very discriminatory game because as you get older, your ability to play Blitz and calculate fast goes really out of the window. So yeah, that's why, you know, um, that is especially why, you know, I come really suspicious of all those high accuracy players because in the blitz it's a very very intuitive game it really kind of shows your strategic understanding it's very normal to blunder in blitz 
So somebody winning or losing the Blitz game is absolutely meaningless. Okay. Um, yes, but I, I, I do get very, very worked up every time I lose. Sure. Uh, but I try to be fair. Okay, I try to go over the game later and then see if um, what really I took as the um, suspicious play, maybe it was not so suspicious. Okay, I try to be fair. Okay, um, let's see. That that goes to the online nature of uh, playing chess. Um, every top players I used to be playing a lot online. Not really, not really. Um, it's a completely different generation of people. Now, if you look at the generation of people that grew up in the 80s and 90s, they don't really play much chess online. The phenomenon of Kramnik just joining to play on Title Tuesdays is pretty much new. You don't see Gary playing Kasparov like ever on online chess, even in his uh, heyday when he was a champ. Uh, he, he never played online chess. Uh, do you see Anon play chess online? Do you see him ever play in title Tuesday? Nope, you don't. Um, sure, you, you see Magnus playing and the rest of the guys. Do you see Dink play chess online? Nope. Nepo, very rarely now. So this statement that a lot of top players, almost all top players playing online is simply not true. Because they understand that it's detrimental. What is the point of playing online for the professional player? Because if you're playing for result, that means you have to show your opening preparation. But why would you show your opening preparation, which consists of months and weeks of uh, nurturing and finding and analyzing ideas only to waste it after this game, everybody will see it, to win a measly online prize when you can use this idea in a World Chess Championship match and, wins and win a million dollars. Okay. So... Um So a lot of times I play chess online. Um, I play openings that I either played my whole life. Again, I stopped analyzing. I'm a retired player, actually. I'm a retired player. I, I'm not playing competitive chess. I stopped playing in World Cups. I was invited to play in the World Cup quite a few times, but I, I refused because, you know, I see no point. I am, I'm a retired player. I'm not fighting for the World Chess Championship title. And uh, I want to allow younger players to take a shot at it and learn. Sure, you, sure, you know, the only reason for me to play in the World Cup would be just money. And they, they, if you qualify there, uh, the loser of the first match in the World Cup, he basically gets uh, guaranteed $6,000. Well, it was so in the, in, 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 in the old days. I'm not sure how much they get these days. In the second round, if you... If you get knocked out in the second round, you get like $10,000, okay? That's a lot of money. So, but I just think it's not fair because, you know, if I'm retired and I'm not playing to qualify for the World Chess Championship, I'm just playing, you know, to get to the maximum number of rounds and get the maximum pay out. That, that is not why I play chess, okay? So... And the online chess is uh, even funnier because, uh, okay, knight h4, very interesting idea, yeah? If I take on a4, you play knight f5, and then you're bringing the queen. But this is still a pawn, yeah? Still a pawn. I can also just play g6. And then this knight kind of is stranded. Um, I don't know, very, very interesting. I really don't like allowing the knight on f5 because um, oftentimes white is willing to sack a pawn to get the knight here and then to open the files for the rooks. But you know, in the interest of the game and this particular situation, let's take on a4, let's see where it leads to, okay? I just want to see how strong is white attack here. That's what I want to do. So, two choices, knight of 6 back or take on d2. If I take on d2, I develop your pieces. Maybe it actually makes more sense to go back. But on the other hand, by taking on d2, I have a chance to develop my bishop to f6 and protect my king. Okay. So I think that's pretty worth it. That chance is worth it. So I'll take this chance. Um, judging for by now, I'm 
it looks like white definitely has compensation. It looks like that, yeah, for sure. Uh, when h3 is needed, when d d3 is too slow. Oh, that's a pretty good question, Mr. Atomic uh, Morphe. Actually, I think you should just play both. The, 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 none of them is bad. Okay. Um, mostly, the idea behind each move is to stop the martial attack. <laughs> the infamous martial attack. Okay. That absolutely incredible invention by Frank Marshall. And also, if you play d3 or h3, but it mostly applies to d3, because you are not playing the plan with c3, d4 anymore, then you kind of save a tempo on rookie one, okay? Then you don't really need to play rookie one anymore. Although you do, because you do need to place this knight on d2. But if you play d3, then often white plays knight c3, okay? And then knight goes to g3 via e2, and then you play a4. So. The, the reason you put the pawn on d3 and you don't play c3 d4 is because you're trying to cement this pawn chain which prevents you from uh, being counter-attacked in the center by c4 and d5 which makes sure your pawn chain stays okay so we probably need to get rid of this guy knight on f5 is super strong then i'm gonna try to close this bishop here all right, this is a Spanish bishop, very, very famous bishop. So you really want to close his area of influence. Uh, why would you take the spawn and allow my knight to enter the game with a tempo? Okay, it's possible, I guess, why not? So knight to c4. Yeah, knight on h6 is very, very strong for white. Makes my king very vulnerable. But I don't see how I get made it. So let's play it out, okay? All right, and let's hit this pawn on f6. g5, the supporting pawn needs to go. I don't like this pawn. Possibly queen d6 was stronger to chase this queen from this very powerful location where it eyes uh, a lot of and does a lot of things. So he is pointing out that I missed the simple tactics. If I take on g5, he takes on c4 and plays queen e5 checkmate. Yeah, that's a good point. I blundered this. Um, pretty good point. So bishop c6, and I try to correct my mistake. I don't have 95, or do I? Hmm, pretty interesting question. I am hunting for the Red October, hunting for this rook. Yeah, you could have played rook c5 back, yeah? It would be a lot stronger than this move. Not a bad game, but you missed rook c5. After rook c5, you're pretty much winning. Ah, you have this. Crap. <laughs> All right, this guy got me. What can I say? He got me. Uh. Oh my god. I don't have any moves. Go 
good job. He's completely winning here. Yeah, but I'm very curious about this knight h4. It's a pretty well known position, but knight h4, what is that? Hmm. You know, I played Brer for a very long time. I remember I looked at knight h4 only briefly. Apparently, it's a very playable move. It's kind of messed up because it shows g6 as white move, but okay. So g6 is what I wanted to play, probably the most logical, and then you play the same idea. Yeah, but 94, 95, 92, bishop f6 looks correct, queen g4, king h8, and h4, very logical. So Blair had to take on d4, play knight b6 with the idea of uh, bishop d5, or most importantly, you see this bishop c8 idea? This knight is what makes white position so good. So bishop c8 trying to trade this knight, it eliminates a lot of danger from black position. All right, all right, Mr. MVM, thank you for this, this extremely interesting um, line. Uh, Chess lack of creative players that bring human new chess ideas? Not really. There's plenty of creative players. Uh, plenty. Just look at the top 100 LO player list and basically every second player is like very, very creative. So I kind of disagree with that statement. Hmm. All right, so we play d4. Hmm. Wait, what is this? Oh, it's... Um, hmm. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> okay. <coughs> hmm. I guess I... I misplayed something again. Yeah, it's funny how easy to miss is misplay the opening phase. Yeah. So d5. Let's try to prevent that. So I think I think I recall seeing this somewhere. Just can't recall where exactly I saw this. Hmm. Probably knight c3. Yeah, black seems to be fine. Yeah. Again, again, it's a very gambit line. Perfectly playable in the blitz game, but in a classical game, this is probably. A really bad idea for white to play this. Um, okay, so now rook can go to e1. And the question that is very relevant here, where does this bishop go? f4 or g5? Yeah, I feel like we need to stop this thing. So let's play bishop g5. And bishop h4. It's okay. White has superior development, which should be able to compensate. Now knight e5. Centralization is always a good thing. Also, you're opening your queen to possible uh, action on the king side. I kind of don't like b6 move, to be honest. I think. Black had something better, but 
I could be wrong. Um, you don't know what to do with black. <laughs> okay. Good question. Me neither. <laughs> Me neither, man. But this doesn't look right because of nice C4, yeah? That's for sure doesn't look right. Because you just sort of invited uh, me to play d6 at some point. Or completely ruin your pawn structure, yeah? Yeah, it's a total ruination now. That pawn structure is a mess. Let's put it mildly. But maybe you can defend this, yeah? Yeah, knight f5, so... Hmm. And the big questions arise, yeah, how to play this. Take with the queen or with the pawn. I'm thinking queen f3, knight g3, fg3 actually to prevent that queen from getting to f6. Because you play bishop d3, knight g3, then again you can take with an f pawn, you can take with an h pawn. But black king, queen gets to f6, it will be very difficult to get rid of that queen. So I think queen f3 is a legit move. To stop queen f6 after the trade. And probably take with an f pawn. Looks pretty legit. Although you could you could potentially take with the queen and just go for the f4 to attack this guy. Also very very interesting. So interesting position. Probably a good time to bring the bishop back. Back into the game. And then we want to do something um, to open this position up. Probably g4. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this looks very strong actually, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, maybe black is okay, actually. Yeah. I put too much emphasis on the uh, developmental advantage, but black just survives. All right. G4 is kind of weird chess, but okay. Pretty weird chess. I play queen e7. Can I play queen e7? Ah, you have check. Shut. All right, fine. Grab, grab. All right, it must be noted this bishop doesn't have many moves. This bishop does not have many, a lot of moves. Kinda cool in my book. And now he has zero moves. very defensible for black but you have to be very precise because this bishop is still a big pain in the ass
but we are getting to your pawns, yeah, eventually. Every single one of them. Because your bishop is terrible. Alright, good job. Um, okay, GG, not bad. All right, so let's do something uh, a little bit more exciting. Let's play the Cordell Archangel line. This is pretty good line to play against d3. White plays early d3, which is why... Oh, bishop b3, wow. Okay, I can even take it, actually, and go after this bishop. For sure, white is okay, but black's fine. In this pawn structure, black is completely fine. So knight h4, etc, etc, standard stuff pretty much is going to happen, I'm thinking 98, let's go deep defense, but okay if you play like this then I go back, because this has now become weak. Definitely play c6, and you get a superior version of the um, Nidorf. The Nidorf White has pawn on f2, but here this pawn is doubled, and this is really weak. Take the pawn. Ooh. I don't know. Uh, do they have a rest day tomorrow, the World Chess Championship? Probably they do, yeah. I mean, they're mortals. They need some rest when they play such exciting chess. Queen b6 probably, um, to make sure we hit this guy, even if a little. Bishop d3 or bishop b7. Bishop b7 looks human. So we're looking at this king side. We have four versus three, pawn majority. That means we should play here on this side of the board, okay? Because that's where we are stronger. Okay, e4 allows me to play queen c6. Create additional pressure, maybe. Um, but I'm also happy with rook f8. Because every trade brings black closer to the um, pawn on game with an extra pawn. So that's pretty good. 
And the reason I won't allow this taking is because then my bishop will be opened and I can enter the second rank. Okay, we need two protects the pawn. That makes a lot of sense. Um, this move makes a lot of sense. So maybe queen c6 actually. Create the battery. Also take the square under control. Um, okay, grab the pawn. Grab more pawns. These pawns have no rivals. All right. Thank you for the game. Yes, and the tournament is here. You can join the tournament here. All right. Um, no, but. That was the d3 bishop c5, and if white actually plays uh, like this, yeah, if he allows black to, if you play d4 and weaken your pawn structure, that's what happens. All right. So last time uh, I didn't manage to didn't manage to get any advantage in the famous Berlin end game. Um, I haven't analyzed anything after that, so my knowledge did not improve. But let's go on to this very standard uh, Berlin endgame. This is not a standard Berlin endgame. Hmm. This is not a standard Berlin game. So what do you do here? Probably it's queen e2. Because now you have the possibility to develop the rook on the d file. I think he mis he misplayed it, yeah, because after this uh, it's kinda of advantage white, yeah. Okay, I'm thinking, uh, is it really that bad? It should be pretty bad for black. But how bad it is? How bad it is? E6 looks natural, followed by knight e5, yeah. Then queen h5, what is black gonna do? I wonder. I'm not sure, so let's try it. Knight to e5. Okay. Just something very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. Um, check. Because I want to keep the queens on board. Bishop F4 is playable. Check. 
check first then bishop a5 yeah small mistake because you're threatening rook h1 then yeah you, you, you keep missing tactics man Yeah, he had to play knight g7 because then he chased my queen away from his uh, rook on h8. I probably had to play something like queen h6, knight f5, queen h3, but then he can finally play rook g8. And uh, queen h7, rook g7 or something. I thought that was important. All right, so we waited until he played bishop e7. Now we play d3. This is pretty famous line these days. C3. Yeah, bishop e6, and pretty much everybody plays bishop a2 here. Pretty much, but let's let's take this pawn. Let's play knight e2. And just play against the structure, okay? Let's try to play against the structure. You know, I always can, can feel very, very uncomfortable when I get the double pawns. And I try to avoid as much as I can, but sometimes double pawns are actually okay. Like in Sveshnikov, this double pawn on e6 is actually fine. Okay, Mr. Shan Hadip. Again, you should guys uh, analyze stuff after you played it, okay? C4 is pretty common. Also, the structure, you know, incredibly enough, this pawn structure reminds me of the Queen's Gambit accepted line where black goes for this. E D four bishop c five crazy line, remember? This is very very similar. Alright, so developments is everything. How do we use this weak pawn here and double pawn here? You gotta go for the um, central pawn chain. Um, I mean, queen side pawn break, yeah. Gotta make pass pawn. That's what you have to do. Okay, it's already to, to Indian time. Okay. You mean it's 2.32, right? Or because I, I didn't realize there are time zones where they're half an hour behind or above. Hmm. Kind of weird. All right, let's go B5. Queen gets to b3, probably the best square for the queen, or you can play a4. And then you want to sort of provoke this pawn movement, so your 
double, your, your connected pawns can go. This is for sure advantage white, thanks to the pawn chain here. Double pawns are kind of more pronounced here, yeah. Though I'm missing some 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 things like this, maybe I'm. Um, but okay, it's rook. Which rook? Probably this rook. Hmm. Okay, yeah, I I blundered. Yeah, I blundered as usual. Oh, actually, that is a really bad blunder. That's a really bad blunder. Okay, thank God I have 9d2. I don't have to take this pawn. All right, give me a second. I haven't, I haven't eaten much today. I'm gonna grab some food, okay? All right, this guy gives me a really big challenge. Always, yeah. Probably there is a mate somewhere. I'll be very surprised if he doesn't mate me somewhere. Oh yeah, there it is, okay. Hmm. Pretty weird. He missed the mate somewhere. Pretty sure he missed the mate somewhere. Like a bunch of mates were there. Pretty winning for you, yeah. But I'm curious though. B5, AB, CB, 97, T5, Queen, C2. All right. So this is advantage white. But after Queen, G6, I made the wrong move. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Guys, this is important. This is why Dink played Rook A2 in the yesterday game in Nimzo, okay? You need to protect the second rank, especially these squares. All right, that's what you need to do. Because then if he takes an e4, he has no time to bring the knight here. Okay, because you take the pawn with this. But the critical thing is, well, when you play rook a2, you also avoid this bishop. And you avoid this square. Okay, the rook also remains on this file where it needs to protect the pawn and protects the queen. So this is very famous, actually, uh, setup. So keep this in mind, okay? This is a very nice defensive setup for white. So I played rook c1 and I blundered that. I actually wanted to sacrifice an exchange, which I think is okay. However, he, he does the check first, you yeah? know? 
I cannot take because my queen is captured and then he actually takes knight with a check. Then he grabs the queen. That's what I missed. So I had to play knight d2 and now knight f5, knight e4, knight h4. And um, apparently white is still okay, which is very, very surprising to me. But okay. But not knight of six. Knight of six is bad. Yeah, you should just take this, man. Exactly, because if I take like this, then there's check. And I think you can also do this check. No queen h4 because rook h2, right? And then just rook h2 and still mate. So you're, you were winning, man. All right, good game. Uh, hello, Mr. Anish. All right, so let's play actually. Uh, no, but this is terrible, no? You should play a6 first because now you just give me this pawn. No? All right, so it should be a little bit better for white, I think. Yeah, because my bishop takes away these two squares from this guy. Okay, now there is a small dilemma because if I play h4, then this guy goes to f5, right? So I have to attack him. And probably just should play knight c3. Because if I take them, this double pawn is actually very strong. by taking these key squares and this pawn will be very weak. Mm. It's very interesting, but okay, rook c1, just defend. But it's quite possible black is fine here. Mm. Usually you need to play g4 in Berlin, almost every time. This allows that. Okay. So king g2, let's take the king out of this mating zone. Now we can play f4. And once you can push this pawn to f5, white has advantage because we connected our four, ver four versus three pawns here. And also we managed to close this bishop, which is a big achievement. Ding said it was a deep idea. Yes, he said the same thing about h3. I'm still not impressed with h3, but again, he is the world, he is the one who is playing the match with the world chess championship, you know, he is the guy who is duking it out with um, Nepo. 
G6, okay. Hmm. So if I play knight e4, ah, there is no threat. Hmm, good move. Good move. And you control the D file, yeah. So maybe you should just suck it up and play this, yeah. Just protect this pawn. And suck it up. But I need to keep that bishop outside. Pretty weird structure, to be honest, but I still think white is a little bit better here. Because um, I don't see how you f can force me to play f6, but I do have this knight f6 idea, yeah? So, how exactly are you going to counter that? And if I push can probably play king h5. Why not? Mm -hmm. I don't have this, yeah. Okay, now it's um, clearly no compensation for black. So this is a winning situation. There's no compensation at all. Maybe not like this, no, but okay. I'm just curious, what is the evaluation of this position? Ooh. That's what he missed, okay? You had taken a five and played rook g2, and rook takes c2. All right, what did I miss? Wait, I could have just taken this knight, yeah? What's the difference? Rook d1, g6. The difference is you don't have active rook now and your bishop is closed. I can just play this, yeah? Uh, and it's also very important tempo not allowing this rook here. Now this bishop is forever locked together with this rook who has to protect this bishop. Wow, you guys see this, right? This is the this is what ideal situation looks for white like. Your pawns close the bishop way out of this box, and knight controls all the squares, and the rook has to protect this bishop. Then you just play king f4, rook g1, and you start going after all these pawns because black is forever closed. Hello, Mr. Solo Vastral. You start to learn hippo defense. Okay. You missed the hippo arena recently. So we're not, we're not likely to have another hippo arena. Um, but okay, maybe. 
next month. Alright, so this was pretty interesting game. Alright, let me play now the side of the board. I'm actually not sure this is correct, but D3 is definitely not correct. Hmm. You just allow me to play like this. Okay, CD5 is okay. But now after Bishop G4, White is just completely paralyzed, no? This is terrible for White. You don't play like this. Hmm. I mean, maybe, it just doesn't look good. Yeah, Bishop G5, okay, makes sense. Mm. Mutual pin, yeah. Kind of funny. Now the big question, how should I recapture? I don't really know. Probably just take the bishop and play for the structure, yeah? Looks pretty good. Looks pretty good. Uh, I don't know. Knight h5 also looks pretty decent. Yeah, I learned that sometimes you have to play knight h5 very early. You know, like straight away fix this thing. Because if you hold on to this, then white can just sort of break through or something. So sometimes you have to, you know, really grab stuff immediately. Um, all right, let's grab. Mm. Fine, end game is good. Any end game where you have double pawns, I'm all for it. All right, let's win a tempo. You don't take, okay? <clears throat> you want your opponent to take first. It's not like who is gonna blink first. It's not it. That's not the point. <laughs> but it's very close. <laughs> this. Original idea was to put the knight on a 5 but the threat of rook e5 really forced my hand. Probably all, everything is on the white squares, yeah? Everything will be on the light squares. Uh, okay. Let's go for the slow torture. It doesn't sound right, but that's exactly what it is. It's a slow torture. Just being honest, guys. should really keep the rook on 
because now you're completely limited in your counterplay. Okay. Yeah, you really need the rook on, man. I don't know what you're doing. Also, you're giving my king a chance to attack your pawns. It's not a good idea. Should have kept the pawn on a4. Three targets for an attack. Terrible. Terrible. Just make a move. Knights are very, very tricky. They can go both ways. Nope. <clears throat> Not allowed. You're not allowed there, man. I feel really bad for this bishop. Really bad for that bishop. Romanian. The point is not to win, the point is to practice this opening. A lot of, <clears throat> a lot of people stop playing Spanish, but it's a, it's a very important classical educational opening. Because a lot of <clears throat> structures in the Spanish opening, uh, they just common for all the other openings. Okay. If you know your Spanish, you should be quite comfortable in uh, other structures very similar. All right, should be three probably. Although we can play Bishop C two. This is Archangel improved. This is. Uh, you know, the, the, the fact that black delays playing bishop b7 sometimes doesn't play it at all is the more modern way of playing this. In the past, people used to automatically develop the bishop here. But these days, they wait. So they can play bishop g4, they can play bishop d7, or they can play bishop d7. It's now a huge um, alternative. Okay. that too yeah okay and uh, there are several ways for white to play this position the more solid way of playing this is by 
making opposing bishop stand on e3, followed by knight d2, h3, rook e1, etc., etc. But the old main line is bishop g5. But the point is, you want to trade this knight and then sort of pin this guy. Black usually does not take here with the king while the, his king is in the center. It is um, not something that you really want to do. You need the pawn on e5. You rarely take the pawn because you give white a lot of squares immediately. Okay. See, the knight now hits this pawn, controls the squares, and most of all, now this pin is very, very dangerous extremely dangerous thanks to this new threat of knight d5 okay so you gotta be very very careful when you play like this because guess what you can end up with a terrible pawn structure see what i'm saying You're gonna have double pawns here, while I'm gonna have two versus one here. Knight a5, reasonable move, but I still just move. And you're still gonna have bad bishop here. Hmm. So the only thing is, should I play d5 or something? Kind of like d5 immediately close this bishop because knight this is going to be the best square for the knight hands down untouchable by enemy bishop controlling a lot of squares potentially hitting this weak benoni pawn and also the square yeah black is very limited now queen f6 correct um all right so let's play b3 and make sure this knight is gonna stay on the rim for a little bit, at least. So this knight has no rival. Very strong, very good. Queen d2. Centralization. We can also play rook a4 now. Unless I'm blundering some tactics, which I don't think I am. And if this pawn falls, black gets a lot of problems, yeah. All right, just to show you, see the position is plus almost two. So when, whenever a pawn plays d4, you should just move your bishop here, which is main theory. Again, you need to keep this pawn here. After you take, take, knight c3, logical, and bishop g5, you see it's plus one, yeah, almost. Uh, so it's, it is plus one, because you gave the center. You should hold your center, okay? You cannot sacrifice your front line. Front line is important because it controls a lot of squares. Because otherwise, now you're playing on the sides like a Hannibal, yeah, against the Romans in that battle, but you don't have really good side 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 game plan. Okay. And this Roman square in the center is very, very strong. Okay. Hey Mato, what's up? Um all right. So everybody is going for this, okay, d6, yeah, d4, yeah. That's the thing. If you play Stanius, you have to play something like this. You gotta play d4. You don't have to waste time on c3 because if you can play d4 in one move, why would you want to waste time, right? Makes sense. And now we can go into the Maris and Bind structure, actually. Maris and Bind structure here is just as good as in Sicilian game.
yeah so this is pretty standard after you know black gets double pawns but sometimes these pawns can be strong because um, if you play c5 this pawn allows the creation of this square control which is considered to be okay hmm. this is still double pawn formation I really don't like it when I get it but you can try and play with it I guess E5 looks very critical now, but hmm. but bishop g5 maybe even bishop f4 looks okay. We need to finish the developments. Get the rooks here in the central files. That's what we need to do. The bishop on a4 is actually is looking the very important square in e8. So at some point black will have to trade this bishop because you need rook on e8. Now we have the structure, yeah. All right, so knight to d5, centralization of the knight. Again, e5 was very, very likely a better move, but I think this is also playable. Hmm. I'm not sure what the um, evaluation of this position would be, but 9b6 allows me to permanently uh, fixate this pawn. This is for sure good for white. Because now black will be stuck to absolutely passive defensive position. Pawns on the dark squares, targets. Bishop has no vision. Instead of 9b6, bishop f6 with the idea of bishop d4 was pretty standard. Um, all right. So it's a good idea to make a loft often in these positions. And then sort of um, is there a queen of six in the air? Maybe. Okay, let's just move the bishop away from all the danger. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Queen f6, rook e2, rook d2, maybe even queen c2. All right, actually, I think I messed up a little bit. Yeah, he got some active counterplay. H3 more probably H3 was the culprit. It's a little bit too slow. I thought that maybe I can control something. Um, but rook d8 is definitely not correct. The rook should be on e6, protecting the pawns like this and counterattacking my central pawn. Rook d8 is way too passive. Yeah, rook e6 makes more sense. Mm. Okay, I guess he is listening. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right, Mr. Goosey's Tion, see you. Wasn't D6 hanging? I didn't see how it was hanging, but it's quite possible. Yes, eventually we're going to pile up on this pawn, for sure. For sure. So black has to be ready for this queen d3, bishop takes d6 plan, yeah. Uh, and the big question... Or well, maybe just rook d3 and then um, build Elha and Gan, yeah. So it's very important that this rook is here and protects against the infiltration. So it's it is Alakhain Gun. Thanks to the spin, you can take this pawn. Which is why black needed to play rook c6 instead of this 
expansion here. Uh, but okay. Grab more stuff. speed I'm trying to think of a challenging line for you let's try this line probably you're familiar with it but it's quite interesting it's something I actually considered analyzing and playing for black and classical game mm, but not nice as we know I'm not not aware of this move Something like this. A3. Okay, I understand you want to save your bishop, yeah? But uh, in Spanish game, you gotta really play more, a little bit aggressively. If you want to hope to get an advantage. I remember you used to play this um, H3, bishop G2, D3, line against me all the time, yeah? What made you stop? Are you still playing it? Um, all right, definitely take. Knight is seven. So there are many ways for black to play this position. C6, knight C6. But I'm just gonna probably play the the very logical way of just going for a five some point. I think that makes a lot of sense. But before you play a five, like in any King's Indian, you need to prevent this knight e6 idea, yeah. So e6 looks good. Now that neither knight nor bishop can go to g5, you're ready for f5, more or less. And then it becomes... Ext uh, Mr. Texas Pete, what happens after e4? Hmm. I do not believe you have enough compensation, so I'm going to play it. You get maybe two pawns. I don't think you get three. For a rook, yeah. So be very careful of this. It's a common theme in English opening. That's why white always puts rook on b1 before going for this. Uh, you can resign. That's fine. Oh, really? You can resign after move 10. Okay. You gotta make one more move and then you can resign. <laughs> yeah, this is actually the first time I see this. You know why they don't allow resigning? Um, so early, so that people won't send back stuff or get those arena points, okay? So that makes a lot of sense. No, but you know, this foresight, yeah? You cannot resign before move 10. It's really showing the attitude, you know, towards people and the way they, they, the things they can do. 
a big trust in the human nature, man. Not. Mm. Not really, yeah. No trust. Yeah. Be very careful. Because if you allow this, your pawn chain gets pretty much destroyed. And now you have to be very creative to get out of this mess. I would be very unhappy with this position. But <clears throat> probably you have to play knight f6 and castle and try to use your development or something. And think f6 was it. F6 is definitely not it. Knight of six castle. <clears throat> okay, this this is very reasonable. You try to go to the end game. That makes sense. I agree. And so does the sense to bring this knight immediately here. <clears throat> C4 knight C3 also to go hunt the spawn. And this makes more sense, I think. Okay. You're so glad this arena is in rated. Mato, you really care about chess.com rating? My god. Oh, you never play Spanish with white Mr. Texas Pete. Oh my god. How do you expect to improve your chess without playing the most basic classical opening ever? You should definitely start consider studying uh, the classics and Marshall Gambit, dude, really. You'll learn so much. Blasphemy. Could we do an arena on Naka Manson Gambits? What the heck is a Naka Manson Gambit? You have only played four nights, but if you don't widen your experience, how how can your perspective improve? I mean, we improve as humans when we learn on more different various experience. We don't repeat the same thing over and over. I mean, you do that only if you have some job that doesn't really want you to be very creative, yeah? But still, it's kind of, kind of weird, man. I, I'm not criticizing; it's just very curious. Um, it would really help with your chest too, you know. Actually, yeah. You're not sure. You're not gonna take up the Spanish, but you glad to do these arenas? Yes, of course. And I understand that a lot of people, they like to play really offbeat openings where they feel comfortable and they play them all the time so they don't get beat up. I fully get that. I do. But if you want to improve, you got to start stepping out of that comfort zone. All right, 9G5, standard, when you get a position like this. Oh, this is so cheap, 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 cheap house move, but <laughs> I'm so tempted to play it. Yeah, King D8, 96 mate, but okay. Yeah, I'm not gonna play it, man. <laughs> it's just so cheap. Very, very cheap move. Um, Yeah, so I'm just gonna play bishop b3. Probably bishop c4 was much better to put the knight on f7, yeah, but okay. All right, f4, okay. 
Good job, you're getting my pieces pushed back. The counteroffensive has begun. You know, one of my favorite cinematics from the gaming is probably Microsoft's Mac Commander movie, Mac Commander game. I don't know how many of you played Mac Commander, but it's like my favorite game for a very long time. And most of it was because of the opening cinematics. I thought it was like one of the best things, especially in that era. All right, let's do something, yeah. Okay. I'm not sure why I started talking about this though. Um, I forgot. I already forgot what I wanted to say. Not good. Not good. Uh, anyways, check. Check. Grab. More checks. More checks. And yet more checks. And still more checks. And finally it's over. Okay. Sorry, dude, you've been suffering so much, I know. Uh, just passed on PC. I don't think it had nice cinematics. Um, your Cosbot Arena from years ago changed your life? Really? It really changed your chess life? Did you meet the chess girlfriends and you both enjoy Carlsbad? Just kidding, man. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was a bad joke, I know. Um, all right. Um, thanks for suffocating you over the chess boards. Well, that's how people play chess, okay? This is not really suffocating. It's the style that I tried to learn and imitate from my first chess idol when I was a kid. And the first thing was not about this Python style, yeah? But the thing I heard about Petrosian was this guy, I didn't know who, who he was, is that I heard that this guy doesn't lose much. In fact, he loses the least amount of time compared to everybody else. And you know what? That really piqued my um, curiosity because, you know, I had this really crazy father who liked to beat me up after each time I lose the game. So naturally, I want to learn how not to lose in chess, okay? Naturally. So I, when I hear about this dude that never lost, that very rarely loses chess game, I was like, all right, let's learn. And that led one thing to another. And then I learned what is prophylaxis. And then I learned a lot of other great things about the the one and only Tigran Petrosian. Okay. Is the danger. He had this amazing Spidey Sense danger. We didn't know it was called Spider-Man Sense, okay? Because we chess players really don't go into this um, anime stuff, okay? Maybe some, some chess players do, but it was a little bit too early for that, I think. But, you know, it was just called a sense of danger in those times. Sense of danger. All right, I don't know, just rooks belong on the open files. So that's what I'm going to do. 
I'm gonna put my rooks on the open files. Thank you for subscribing, Mr. Stainkool. Hello, sticky situation. Welcome from. Okay. Anyone try the Schleeman? Carl's Bud? <laughs> no, we don't, we don't. They don't name. In chess, we we we're you know we're intelligent people. We don't name things after anatomy. Um, parts, you know. We're like really enlightened like that. Uh, all right, so maybe let's grab the spawn. It's not really a grab, but what I really wanted to do is I wanted to provoke c6 so my rook can finally enter the seventh rank. That's what I wanted to get. Because suddenly the knight on e7 is. Uh, not is, but he has a problem. Oh my god, that, that move is... Uh... Oof. I have no words for this move. Um... I guess it's playable. I guess it's playable. If it's playable, then it doesn't matter how ugly it is, it's, it's a good move. Yeah. Yep. All right, good job. Good job. You managed to get your pieces out in the open. Um, all right, so let's go after the spawn. We need something concrete. Um, yeah, so, you know, Tigran Petrosian lived like in the 60s, yeah? And he came up with the spider sense uh, stuff back in the 60s. He was like a pioneer. You know, this guy was... A bloody pioneer, he developed so many things. He introduced the famous positional exchange sacrifices. Okay. He introduced the sense of danger, the prophylaxis, the killing off your opponent's counterplay in the bud. Not in the bud. In the bud. All right. Okay. Um... Knight h4 makes a lot of sense because this pawn has been weakened by the pawn movements. So you see how the pawn movement in the very beginning of the game it kind of is important, right? I don't know which move you played h6 on. Uh, oh, you can, okay, you played it on the 15 move. But you see the pawn structure now really influences uh, how you're gonna untangle your pieces here they tried fried liver but it was a bad taste so no more body parts okay Nimzovich established prophylaxis correct You're correct. Uh, my bad. It's my mistake. Yes. Nimsovich was the giant who introduced civilization to the thing called prophylaxis. However, Petrosian improved on this concept and made it an art. Made it an art form. form. And you gotta change one pair of rooks so that your rook becomes unchallenged master and commander of these of these seas. Uh. Yes, to be honest, Nimzo was the genius of his era. I would say that Nimzo was way larger uh, and more influential. Uh, man in his time than practically any of the world champions who lived because Lasker was not a pioneer he was a user he did pioneer psychological approach to chess which was huge but in pure, pure, in pure chess terms um, 
he was a user because he basically used his opponent's mistakes and he was a very practical player. So his only but very influential introduction to chess was the introduction of the chess psychology. Huge. Uh, but in terms of chess, pure chess knowledge and influence, I would say Nimzo, which Aaron was the most influential person because uh, like Lasker, Capablanca was a very practical player. Extremely practical. Um, he probably was the best known for his uh, refutation of uh, opening ideas of his opponents. He was also very well known for his extremely accurate play. He was also extremely practical player, but his best chess most likely were those petite combinations, okay? And he is very famous for his uh, endgame mastery, okay? Capablanca and endgame are like synonymous to this day, okay? Uh, but again, in terms of pioneering of chess concepts, I would say uh, Morphe probably not so much. He's a representative of the Romantic era, and he was a forefather of the dynamic chess, but there are not that many concepts, yeah? It was very close to the 19th century chess, but he combined sort of strategy and r romantic chess together. Also an extremely accurate player, but Iron, you know, he really, like, really was the first to sit down and categorize uh, most of the chess concepts in his book. So people no longer had to learn it by word of the mouth. They could like read it like an educational material from his book. And he gave those chess concepts a name. And, uh, you know, it's like printing press, okay? Printing press made a revolution. It made everything more accessible, and so does Aaron Nimzovich. He made uh, chess a lot more accessible and understandable to the new generation of players. So in that respect, yes, uh, Nimzovich was huge. Um, and then the later champions, they improved upon this, right? But then again, every champion still brings something. Uh, like Batvinik, the only thing he brought to chess was basically to, to modernize it by really approaching the chess preparation to the game and taking chess theory to a level where people realize that you don't have to be talented, you don't have to, you know, be created intelligent, just work hard enough at the openings, cre create a lot of opening traps, and you can win the game right from the opening. Then, of course, we have Tal, the one and only, who came back and said that Romantic Era is not dead. And it's very much alive. And from that time forwards, we have the switch between dynamic player, Tal, followed by the, you know, strategy and domination of technical play and uh, very dry play, right? Again, Batvinik, then we have two very dry players between Nick Petrosian, Smyslov. Some people can call dry chess is like, you know, not really beautiful, but you know, technical dry chess, they're not really that dry. There is a lot of going on things in those dry positions. There are a lot of nuances, you know, but it just takes patience to understand those nuances, to appreciate these nuances and to start to love these nuances, okay? So what I call dry game is not really dry game. To a lot of representatives of the um, school that is not dynamic chess, this dry game contains, again, so much beauty, geometry, right? It's mostly geometrical patterns. Uh, for the players who are representative of the, you know, this dynamic play, for them, these patterns are more of a tactical nature and uh, patterns where aggressive attack looking for compensation, looking for this chaos on the board. That is their pattern, okay? And uh, so from that time, we have this always like a switch, yeah? There's always a switch. So Spassky beats the boring player, and then the boring 
okay, I wouldn't call Bob a boring player, but he was extremely technical when he needed to be. He could be very dynamic, but mostly he was just punishing his opponents with his very accurate play. He was like Magnus Carlsen, okay? So after he didn't defend his title, it was another boring player named Karpov. But again, legendary players. What did uh, Karpov bring as a world champion? He brought that, uh, you know, it's okay. You don't have to be a world champion. You don't have to be the world champion to become a world champion. So, and that actually put a lot more pressure on him to win so many tournaments. He was the first one who felt compelled to win absolutely everything. And so he was the first who started to prove he is like the strongest by far the rest of the world by winning so many tournaments, by demonstrating his superiority in strategy, in tactics and everything, but mostly, again, uh, very prophylactical, dry, um, but aggressive uh, strategic chess player. He's this aggressive strategic chess player. He wants to dominate you by outplaying you. you know? He doesn't want to kill you by going for an attack against you. No, he wants to take everything you have and put it into his pocket. Yeah, in terms of the chess wise position. All those squares, all those diagonals, lines, everything. He wants it, okay? Uh, and then we have, of course, a dynamic player finally named Gary Kasparov who came and dominated. But it was very close battle, right? Because we got a representatives of two schools who were like best representatives at the time. That's why the battles were so dramatic. They were best representatives and each school has uh, certain advantages and disadvantages. All right. Um, okay. Fischer taught Petrosian lesson and peace activity. I, I disagree. Um, if you remember, Bobby went to the Soviet Union, I think. I don't know how many times he went, but he went to the Soviet Union when he was a kid. So he could practice and learn from all these greats. He actually played with, uh, when he arrived to the Soviet Union, he played uh, those blitz games. He learned a lot. Uh, Petrosian was consistently beating uh, Fischer, Bobby, in uh, their classical games. Fischer lost 4-0 to Tal in his first candidates. He was very upset. But later he would, you know, win plenty of games back and he would feel like he solved the Tal problem. But he didn't solve Petrosian problem until he became like really a top top three in the world okay only once fisher beat uh, uh petrosian in the match of the century those fantastic games right only then bobby realized he can he is ready you know um he is ready for the crown he is ready to become the world champion all right, so Petrosian was a very, very hard uh, case for Bobby to crack, but eventually he mastered, he understood what made, uh, you know, Petrosian, Petrosian, he understood and he found the approach to, you know, to, to beat him. All right. Um, all right, what did I miss? How people forget the time had world record of not losing for the longest time. Okay. Great, I, I, I think I read about it, but I don't remember it. I mean, um, but what does this mean? Yeah, the record that you have not lost a single game, because eventually there comes a point where you do lose a game and that streak gets broken. All it means is that, uh, you know, you don't lose, okay? I mean, what else can it possibly mean? Uh, uh, you have a signed booklet by both Fish and Tal when they first played together. Many more signatures from very good gems in there. Very good, Mr. Yog. Okay. Biggest rivalry in chess, Fischer Spassky. Um, biggest rivalry in chess. For sure, Kasparov versus Karpov is the most famous one. Um, Anything comes close, I would say. Hmm. Uh, I would say all those people that never became world chess champions, but who were second, like again, Korshnoi versus Karpov, they played a whole two or three matches. I don't even remember how many matches they played. 
That speaks of a huge rivalry, right? Uh, also, Batvinik playing all those match revanches. I mean, it's crazy. The guy was trying to hold on to his power because uh, being a world champion of Soviet Union was a huge privilege and power. Um, and considering the cycles were three years, once every three years you had a chance to challenge um, the world champion for his crown. Imagine. Um, Ding broke Tyler's records. Official obliterated them. Okay, Alakhan versus Capablanca. That was not much of a rivalry, to be honest, because uh, Alakhan never gave Kappa his chance at rematch. That kind of speaks volumes, and it's actually incredible to me. You know, they were when they were younger, they were kind of friends, but then it became a rivalry. I mean, Kappa gave Alakhan a chance, right? He was considered to be strong, and Alakhan was not. And um, after winning that match, Alekhine was considered to be the genius player. But he never gave uh, Kappa a return match, even though they, they sort of initially agreed that it will be a match revenge. But the fact that the Alekhine didn't give him match revenge speaks volumes, right? Because Kappa was way more gifted. He was a natural uh, at the game. Alekhine had to work was work his way in he had to work out understanding for you know for his opponent and to work on it and develop uh, his way of playing but i think he was pretty much afraid to give kappa a second chance because kappa was very unpredictable um i think he was the best practical player in the world but he never got a second chance yeah he lost the match because uh, he was very careless was very careless. He didn't take Alekhain uh, seriously. He didn't prepare much. I remember, there was a story when he lost the very first game to Alekhain. He was so shocked. He rented a boat and went out to the sea for one day. But it was too late because uh, Alekhain has prepared for this match for many months in advance. Kappa thought he can just come in and beat, beat him. So I don't think it was really a rivalry. A rivalry, uh, rivalry is when you have this many game contest, you know, that going through the years. There was just one match here. Um, didn't bother to come up with the. Um, you wouldn't allow Kappa to play in these same events again. That probably goes to the same. Um, because he didn't want to, but I don't know how much of that true actually is. I remember there was a tournament when Kappa was already world champion, and I'm not sure if they played with Alekhain or not, but Lasker played there, and he actually took the first place, I think, and beat them both. Or maybe he didn't beat them both, but he ended up in the first place and above both Capablanca and Alekhain, and, and Lasker was already, already like 40s and 50s. It was in his 40s or 50s. That was an incredible achievement. I was like, yay, Lasker, yay. You show these youngsters, like, who is the boss, man? That was pretty awesome. Yep, he did. Because, you know, he's Lasker. His psychological method works. Basically, I would say he was like, you know, um, he was uh, to chess what is like, you know, the Sigmund Freud is to the psychology, yeah? <laughs> it was like father of the chess psychology, which is, which is a completely specialized area of psychology. Now, you guys, you have to realize, chess players in general, I think, we are very strange, let's put it mildly, people, okay? We are very strange people. But so are a lot of other gamers and you know, so are people who are focusing on the board games. Checkers, chess, go, and what else is there? You know, all these guys, they're very, very, very special people. <laughs> Normal, everyday world things do not really apply to us, okay? Um, yeah, it's Yankee. I'm not talking about the card games. Card games is a beast of its own. 
<laughs> I'm sorry, but card games is, is a completely different beast of its own. I'm talking about the board games now, yeah? Um, yeah, so... <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Uh, it's been very draining the couple last couple of days. I was very upset about this whole controversy thing, right? I'm still debating whether I should put this answer that I made today on this stream as a response, but you know what? I'm thinking of just, you know, let it go. It doesn't matter. In the end, it doesn't matter. Um, but I felt I needed to tell you my side of the story and um, to show you s some things that are not true and um, to defend my good name, okay? Yes, I know, uh, these days I get very, very easily uh, frustrated, angry, and etc., etc. Again, I am not a professional player anymore, but, you know, still this element of competition gets to me sometimes, okay? All right. All right, that's it. I'll see you guys. It's almost 12 o'clock at midnight. Thank you for coming to the event. We're going to do the Simo on Sunday as usual. Okay. So I'll see you guys on Sunday. And after that, uh, I'll see you on Tuesday. But next weekend, because we because I go to play in the chess Bundesliga, all right, uh, that means I'll have to postpone the the simul or I'll have to do the simul on Thursday. So probably next week, instead of the simul on Sunday and the arena on Thursday, we're gonna do the simul on Thursday because I have to leave on Friday, okay? But for Sunday, we have the simul, okay? I am not an instructor of anybody at any level uh, because one thing, um, as I mentioned before in the beginning of the stream, there are two kinds of chess players. You're either a player or you're a coach. You cannot do both things well because it's too hard, okay? It requires too much time to specialize in something. I'm still sort of, you know, streaming and I'm still sort of competing and playing, even if it's very rare, but I still think it's way easier for me to do than to go and coach because as a coach, there is so much responsibility. There is so much work that you have to do properly, okay? You can't just walk in and say, hey, I think I played this game so many years ago. I looked at this line so many years ago. So this looks kind of okay, so go and play it. As a coach, you cannot do that, okay? You really have to dig into the lines. You have to look at your uh, protege, you know, opponents. You have to do a really good job, okay? And uh, for me, the, the, the quality of the job that is needed to do, at least which is acceptable to me, I cannot spend so much time. And I don't have that energy. So that's why I don't, you know, don't teach anymore. That's why I don't have students. Very, very few. Actually, not few. I just had one, but he is now a very strong grandmaster. So he's on his own. Uh, I'm talking about Mark andrea Maurizi. You know, this uh, French youngest uh, GM. I worked with him for the last couple of years. Uh, I think he is fully ready, you know, to go and conquer the world, sort of. So he is now, you know, trying things. And I, I highly recommend to him to work actually with different people so he can learn different things from different, um, different perspectives on chess, right? Because I don't believe that my perspective is the only correct or is only good is you need to have a big picture and for that you need to learn different things different perspectives from different coaches so so i am encouraging you guys actually you know if you have a coach to go ahead and work with different people and learn from them okay all right guys um all right, guys, so good night, and I'll see you uh, for the simul on Sunday, the usual time. Good night. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your donations and uh, subscriptions. And have a good night, everybody. Good night.